discussing the issues and celebrating the successes of the African-American community. This is Another View. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. In 1926, scholar and historian Carter G. Woodson created Negro History Week in response to the lack of African Americans being included in American history. He chose the second week of February because of the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Now today we celebrate Black History Month where school children get a super dose of black history and churches hold celebrations. But here's the question. In 2010, do we still need Black History Month? I'll let our guests answer the question. Please welcome Gwendolyn Farr, Assistant Professor of History at Norfolk State University, Austin Ray Mitchell, Director of Media Productions with Kendall Alexander Media Operations, Tasha Mitchell, Vice President of Content Development, also with Kendall Alexander, and Anthony Mitchell, President of Kendall Alexander, Alexander Media Operations. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the show. Hello. How are you doing? Gwen, let's start with you. Do okay. we need Black History Month? Definitely. Why? No doubt about it. Because I guess what's in my mind right off is the fact that I teach African American history almost every weekday of my life uh, when school is in session. And uh, I'm always amazed at how much my students don't know. And they are often very amazed as well as what they don't know. And so if you can think of them sitting in a predominantly black college or university setting, Mm. and look at how much they don't know, then you can imagine what the broader communities outside of the university are all about. Now, that's not to negate the fact that some parents take the opportunity, uh, you know, endlessly to bring it to their children, but not everyone is doing that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm a true believer in the fact that as other ethnic groups, racial groups have found uh, pride in their history, then so should we. And I think that we also have the responsibility to learn about the history of those who we live among. So based on your response, and Austin, I'm going to ask you this, since you've done a lot of research in this area, are we still not teaching black history as a part of American history? Uh, short answer, no, we're not. Uh, as she, as uh, the doctor has just uh, spoken of, uh, so many individuals are still uh, unaware uh, of the, uh, the, the contributions of African Americans in, uh, in history. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the American history uh, books and our educational system does not uh, intertwine both cultures uh, together and show how that uh, how it was America was built all together and I believe that uh, with my project not uh, now you know uh, it helps to bridge that gap and uh, hopefully help educational institutions uh, have an opportunity or some type of resource to use uh, to teach their students. Anthony, you, with your company, and mm -hmm. the reason we have you all here is because you're going to be, um, we're going to be airing some yes. of the programming that you all put together to teach young kids, particularly yes. about um, African Americans who've done something significant um, within the his historically mm -hmm. significant. But did you start this because you saw a gap? Yeah, usually with all of our products, we usually try to find a gap, but this was one in particular that the gap was just massive. And, and we saw that there was a total need within, I would say the educational uh, resources as well as homeschool mm -hmm. and as well as, as, well as the, from, the, from elementary on up through middle school that they were not being trained about African-Americans that have made a, a commitment to excellence in our society. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we saw needed to be put in the up, out, front, out front with everyone. So. Mm -hmm. It was, it was obvious that we had to do it, since nobody else did. <laughs> <laughs> Tasha, you, you do content mm -hmm. um, where you're working with um, uh, me different media, mm -hmm. but to bring across the, the same message, which yes. is that there are things happening that, that our community needs to know about. Definitely. Um, to touch on um, what Anthony said in regards to um, fulfilling that need and meeting that need with the content, um, for instance, Black History Month is relevant, but yet if it's not continually integrated into the educational system on a daily basis as a part of American history, then um, expecting students to actually retain that knowledge and understand who these certain historical figures are or certain um, leaders and um, influencers are mm -hmm. as we live right now, they're not going to be able to... Um, be able to take pride in who they are and who, you know, how they also can contribute to society. But Gwen, the argument is, you know, and then people can say to you, when you're on a college campus, why are mm -hmm. you teaching black history? Why aren't you just teaching history? Okay. Well, first of all, after all, Norfolk State University is a predominantly black institution. And uh, when you look at predominantly white institutions, uh, 
institutions that have been founded by Catholics, by Jews, etc. I bet you when you went, when you would go to, to do an examination of their history and look at the type of, of uh, materials and courses, etc., mm -hmm. there is a potpourri of those types of things that include the culture element of the founders of the school, for example, and so on. So if other people can do it for themselves, then certainly it just seems academic sound mm -hmm. that you would want to do it for African-American students too because we've our, our forefathers and foremothers have played a, a dramatic role and a very important role and a humongous role in terms of the building of this country mm -hmm. so uh, I would take uh, some degree of, of being a little unsettled then when I look at because I teach survey of US history too mm -hmm. and I teach Virginia history and if, if I go back over the years I've been teaching 30 some years and look at some of the textbooks that I've been asked to use we're there and if you look at the little amount that we're there in terms of, of even now you begin to question well you know, some of these people out here telling people, and I'm, I'm thinking that people might say that about your material. Sure. You know, you're out here talking about, you know, getting this out here, and uh, we are doing enough. And my thing is that mm -hmm. we're not doing enough, because I think if we were doing enough, then I wouldn't have students telling me uh, periodically through the course, Mrs. Farr, I'm just flabbergasted. I never knew. I have white students who come up to me. Hispanic students who come up to me and just, they're just amazed because they never knew. Mm -hmm. uh, they just, I mean, they look at, I'm, they're just flabbergasted. They're saying, I, I can't understand this. And, and uh, some of them will say, you know, I went through school. I just talked to a lady uh, yesterday in one of my classes, and she was telling me that she was out in the Midwest somewhere, and she's Native American. Mm -hmm. And she was saying, Mrs. Farr, you know, when they talked about the civil rights movement and all that, and my parents were telling me when they were in school and so on, we didn't know, they didn't learn anything about this. And she said, when I came along, we didn't either. She said, I know we got a lot of Native American history, and that was to be expected because of where we were living. But there was but still they never a lot. got the black yeah. history. Yeah, she was just amazed. Austin, you're Uncle Austin yes. <laughs> <laughs> on these things that are called Now You Know History Beat. Yes. And let's take a look at one of them. Um, I sure. think we did one on um, home security system, yes. for example. Let's take a look at it, and we'll talk about it on the other side. Absolutely. Hey, Uncle Austin, it's time for another history beat. Home surveillance systems were no longer created equal after 1969. That's because Marie Brown received a patent for her home surveillance system, which integrated video monitoring allowing you to keep your eyes on the prize. You can learn more about Marie Brown by visiting NowYouKnowXL.com. Until next time, I'm Austin Ray saying if you didn't know, now you know. Now, the Now You Know History Beats will be airing on WHRO um, 15 as well as our kids' channel which is very exciting because that will be an opportunity for all the kids that watch WHRO Kids, um, and that's 15.3. i got to get all these digital <laughs> channels <laughs> correct um, on our air. But in the research that you did, how, how did you research these people? I had never heard of um, Marie Brown and <laughs> that she did exactly. the home security system. So how did you do your research? Well, first and foremost, I, want, uh, I laid out a strategy. Um, one is that uh, since the information is so sparsed out and you have to go out and dig, 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 it seems. Uh, I first started with the internet, and uh, the wealth of information out there was a great place to start. However, uh, the information was so scattered, there was no one database. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I did in that case, I actually went towards uh, learning more, more about patents um, by my own, on my own, and was able to uh, engage an inter, uh, uh, intellectual property lawyer who uh, I got the intern with. And it allowed me to dig deeper and find out more about the patents. By doing that, um, I was able to um, get through kind of what you call the, I guess, the cloudy area where sometimes patents wouldn't show up because uh, there was a fire uh, at the patent office and uh, some of the numbers weren't there anymore, some of the patents weren't there. And mm. so um, um, that strategy was first to find out about those patents. Um, and the way I would go about doing that is to First, find out the relevance. How relevant is this individual? And how did I do that? The invention. Uh, take, for instance, uh, Lonnie Johnson. He's the inventor of the super soaker. A uh, very uh, popular toy. Popular toy, right. And mm -hmm. uh, by doing so, what I did, I went into um, speaking with him uh, personally, uh, who went on to endorse the product, now you know. Um, 
secondly, I wanted to also find out uh, more about uh, the story. Uh, the inventor's story was so important to me because uh, as you get to learn more about the patent, you can learn how this patent come, came about. It wasn't just because someone came up with this idea as flash of genius and then boom, no. Mm -hmm. It was some type of uh, lack of ability or they want to make something more efficient. And some individuals like Frederick M. Jones, take for instance, uh, Marie Brown, these individuals, uh, some of them were not educated. Um, and this story was so powerful to me because it allowed me to uh, deliver this information to individuals to show that, hey, you don't have to be educated for so much, but it's all about you. Mm -hmm. How far are you willing to go despite your challenges? Then you can go about att attacking any of your, your, your shortcomings and, and increasing your ability to improve and grow. Let's take a look at another one. Yes. There's one, Gas Mask by Garrett, about Garrett Morgan. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's time for another history beat. In 1916, Garrett Morgan, along with his brother, entered a tunnel underneath Lake Erie, donning his new gas mask invention to rescue 32 trapped workers. As a result, he was deemed a hero, and eventually his device was adopted by the U.S. Army. Garrett, you the man. You can learn more about Garrett Morgan by visiting NowYouKnowXL.com. Until next time, I'm Austin Ray saying, if you didn't know, now you know. Tasha, there's a lot of production value mm -hmm. to these that where, where you've got music, you've got movie, movement, so forth. Why is that important to you in terms of being able to transmit this information? Um, one, I believe it, it, it addresses all three um, learning styles. Um, and that was very important um, in developing the product to make sure that it um, attracts and it keeps the interest of the different type of learning styles of children and youth and um, to engage their interest and keep it stimulating. Um, using the media as a as a primary um, platform was definitely important because now our society is so, you know, integrated in the media and mm -hmm. multitasking in, in our youth today are growing up even more. There'll be more digital, everything will be online and being able to tap into that and understand how they think and how they view the information, how they absorb the information is important to make sure that you're doing the kinesthetic style and the auditory, whatever, mm -hmm. different types of styles they are. and. Um, utilizing that to be effective. So this was much more of a, um, in, ter in, in terms of putting these together, it was mm -hmm. a lot more than just looking at how can we produce this and make it look flashy, mm -hmm. exactly. but you gave a lot of thought behind how people learn mm -hmm. and what they're going to learn. Exactly. Anthony. I, I would say a lot of it had stemmed from our youngest child who has, he, he learns from all three styles in, in variants of ways. and just talking to my brother Austin about it and I mean keep in mind this was something that was developed over the last three and a half years I mean it wasn't mm -hmm. something that we say hey, six months and we're done <laughs> I mean because a lot of programming went into it um, a lot of the audio production uh, music to find the right music without going through uh, licensing and, and all that yeah. stuff so mm -hmm. um, it's something that we, we really took time to think about through our own experiences with our own family, our own children, and, and I mean, his nephews. So we, we took a lot of how they learn and incorporated it into this because we felt like, okay, well, if these two kids learn with these different styles, then we know that each style represents a, some kid out there, right. you know, or an adult or a young adult. Mm -hmm. So. That was really our, our whole premise of, of how to develop all of our educational products. Okay, let's take another look at one. This one is uh, Percy LeVon Julian Cortisone. Rheumatoid arthritis is a debilitating disease of the joints in which cortisone provides its sufferers some relief. Cortisone, which at one time cost hundreds to produce, only cost pennies because of the research and findings of Harvard graduate Percy LeVon Julian, my man. You can learn more about Percy LeVon Julian by visiting NowYouKnowXL.com. Until next time, I'm Austin Ray saying, if you didn't know, now you know. And if you didn't know, now you know. If you didn't know, now you know. <laughs> there you go. And, that, and that's a great uh, segue to speak on. It's, it's interesting that we make this point. Um, I was actually speaking to an individual yesterday. Um, he uh, came to me and he goes, man, you know, I, you know about a guy named Elijah McCoy? I go, absolutely. I said, let me tell you about Elijah McCoy. And I explained to him more about, besides him being the progenitor of uh, the real McCoy statement, um, oh. it's more than this or that. He was a, a businessman. He was a, a, an entrepreneur uh, until his death. And so uh, knowing, and he was a very educated man. He was sent uh, to France to learn engineering. He came back to the States, couldn't find a job. He could only be a regular engineer and found an efficient way to lubricate engine, uh, uh, engine parts. So. Mm -hmm. uh, 
he came back to say, I introduced him to Now You Know. And he goes, man, you know, this, this is effective. This is something I've been looking for. I have a family and I need something quick and easy like this history beat. And I didn't know all this information. And I explained to him more about another individual called Mark Dean, because this guy's in, in IT. And Mark Dean uh, is an individual who uh, uh, created bus control for mm -hmm. peripherals and computers. So it, without Mark Dean's uh, assistance, we wouldn't be able to have our printers and our USB drives to work. Um, and he was enlightened. He just was just totally just fascinated with this project and said, we need this. Thank you. And actually, we have Mark Dean. Oh, really? So let's take a look at that with the bus <laughs> <All right>. control. <laughs> It's time for another history beat. Your personal computer would not be the same without Mark Dean's input, or better yet, output. His bus control patent allows PCs to communicate efficiently between peripherals such as printers and scanners. <laughs> so thanks, Mark, for giving us the hookup. You can learn more about Mark Dean by visiting NowYouKnowXL.com. Until next time, I'm Austin Ray saying, if you didn't know, now you know. When would you use this type of material? I mean, could this be used on the college level? You think they would still be it interested? It could, uh, but I would be reluctant to say yes. And basically, I say that as something that I could possibly assign students to look at when mm -hmm. we're dealing with certain periods mm -hmm. and, you know, pull out and so on. Uh, what I guess what I have to look out for is that there's so much information that we have to get get through that you have to pace different things. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we often do, for example, we use a learning system called Blackboard. And materials such as this could be entered there and the students would do it at their own pace, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And we would try to fit it in appropriately in terms of where you felt in the learning process it would be. Mm -hmm. So we would probably piece this, piece that. Mm -hmm. And probably too, because we usually take the chronological approach, mm -hmm. we would take it apart in terms of using it uh, from the perspective of, of when of you where go you through are the different periods. You know, yeah. I could see a more effective use there as opposed to just, say, giving it to them and say, today we're going to look at this exactly. mm -hmm. and run through them. Mm -hmm. But it's, it seems to me that, that particularly younger kids, that this might be something that they oh, could definitely. really grasp. Exactly. Yeah. So I'll be curious to see how, yeah. how the reaction exactly. is once mm -hmm. we start mm -hmm. to air them. Tasha. Um, I want to make a point I, mm -hmm. um, you were talking about in the school system. I Right now, um, since Black History Month is um, coming up, a lot of the projects in the elementary and middle school classes mm -hmm. is where they're being assigned or they get to pick certain yes. um, influential leaders and they do papers or reports on these leaders. Mm -hmm. But the list isn't exhaustive and it's not even really, right. you know, lengthy at all. And mm -hmm. it's particularly the, um, it covers everyone that we pretty much know. And so to add to that list, to give teachers the tools to say, okay, here are some other individuals. Mm -hmm. I know in some um, public school um, systems they also have where they um, show little, um, on their cameras, on the TV systems, they show little maybe five or ten minute clips the morning of um, yeah, morning announcements right. and right. just to put that information and keep feeding mm -hmm. them, and you keep know. keep feeding that out there so they yeah. can get it. Let's take a look at one more because I, I just think it's okay. interesting. I want our audience to be able to mm -hmm. catch on as much as possible. It's time for another history beat. You may be driving on the very component that GM engineer Patrick Yasoro knows best, the transmission. He is the holder of 160 plus transmission related patents, making him well respected within his industry. So whether it's five speed, multi-speed, he's responsible for keeping you up to speed. You can learn more about Patrick Yasoro by visiting NowYouKnowXL.com. Until next time, I'm Austin Ray saying if you didn't know, now you know. Now, Anthony, you have a video game mm -hmm. also. Yes. Um, which is now you know XL. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, and tell us a little bit about how that works. Uh, basically, what now you know XL really consists of, it's sort of similar and it gives some of the same information, but it has some other ones because that was in our first series. I mean, we're, we're actually redeveloping this package now to where it's actually releasing here in the next few weeks, mm -hmm. and it's the special edition where it incorporates the video game. Now, this video game gives the user the experience where they can use their DVD remote to actually choose whatever answer they want, sort of like some of the other games like uh, Win, Lose, or Draw or some of these other ones that are out there mm -hmm. currently. But this one has all of the same information except I would say probably like what twenty more that we, right. we added to it. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lot, lot I mean, more. Yeah, we we really went all out with this game, and I mean we're really excited about it because we think that people will utilize this in their home. Uh, we wanted to really touch base for the the home school market, mm -hmm. as well as some of the uh, the uh, elementary 
level mm -hmm. that they can use in their classroom. Sasha, where can they find? Where can people find it if they want to? Um, it's going to be it. available February first on okay. Amazon.com. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. In in the, the final minute that we have. Um, People who are not African American, mm -hmm. tell them why it's important for them to know black history. It's important for them to know black history just as it is important for us as blacks to know about their history. Uh, we talk about globalization. We talk about how our economy has been affected by it. Young people today who go out and get jobs in multinational firms, including firms that originate right here in the States, mm -hmm. have to go different places. They need insights into how people are, how different we are, and how fantastically similar we all are. We are all human beings, <laughs> just different cultural orientations and so on. And so it becomes even more important that we know more about each other. If I'm going to teach you, if I'm going to sell you something, if I'm going to be your friend, your compatriot or whatever. The more we know about each other, I think the more we really do realize that we're all humans and all we have exactly. the same Absolutely. problems and exactly. issues. And on that note, we're out of time, but I really appreciate you all joining us today and to talk Thank about you. this because February is right around Thank the corner you. and uh, and it's mm -hmm. gonna be something that people are gonna be thinking about. And you can watch uh, our air because now you know History Beats will be on our kids' channel. So we're very excited about that. Thanks so much for joining us. And we appreciate the insights of Gwen Farr, Austin Mitchell, Tasha Mitchell, and Anthony Mitchell. And when we come back, more black history, this time the history of the Aberdeen Gardens in Hampton. But first, here's what's happening in Hampton Roads. Welcome back. If you're interested in learning more about African American history right here in Hampton Roads, this WHRO guide is an excellent resource. It's filled with interesting facts and places to visit. One of the places on the list is Hampton's Aberdeen Gardens, a community built by African Americans for African Americans in the 1930s. As Lisa Godley shows us, it still holds its charm as it preserves its history for generations to come. Communities like Aberdeen Gardens were a rarity in the 1930s. The country was in an economic slump, better known as the Great Depression. Nevertheless, some engineers and architects at Hampton Institute were able to secure a $245,000 grant to build a resettlement community for black families. The very idea that blacks would be moving into these brick homes with indoor plumbing outraged some, but after then First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt visited the community and gave her approval, things really took off. The first family moved in in November the 1st, 1937. They moved in on Russell Road. Margaret Wilson should know. They were her grandparents, Charlie and Maggie Jones. Wilson says she was born in an upstairs room in this Aberdeen Gardens home, but raised in her grandparents' home just a few blocks away. Builders constructed 158 three, four, and five room homes, all brick, that could be rented for less than $16 a month or purchased for $3,300 or less. The 158 homes belong to everyone. If you grew up in this neighborhood, you had 158 mothers and fathers. So no matter where you were, or if you got in trouble, you had 158 parents. Wilson is now the president of the Historical Foundation of Aberdeen Gardens. We met up with her at the museum, which is a page right out of American history. Because the house turned museum is on both the national and state register, nothing here can be changed or modified without written permission. Wilson often gives museum tours where visitors can step back in time and see the way the homes were furnished and get an up-close look at what life was like here some 70 years ago. I showed this to the kids because they get amazed that this was a toaster. Wow. Each house had about a little less than three quarters of an acre. Each home had chickens. And we had a chicken coop, which we still have an original one in the back of the museum today. We had uh, horses. They were given uh, peach, pear, and apple trees. We also had grape, uh, vines, blackberry plants and strawberry plants given to each one. Wilson says they were supposed to have a community center, a church, and a school. 
but the school was the only one of the three that actually happened. And it still stands today with a few renovations, of course. The school was used for the community activities like uh, Tuesday night socials, uh, movies, I'm sorry, and then on Friday night was socials and Sunday morning they had church or Sunday school. They named the streets after very prominent African Americans during that era. For example, Walker is named after Maggie Walker, the first African American to own a bank. They've also had their share of famous people who were raised right here in Aberdeen Gardens. Some of the people who have lived here or who grew up in this neighborhood, Helen Reed O'Leary, whose father was Dr. Russell Reed, lived on Langston Boulevard. She was the Secretary of Energy under President Clinton, Judge Wilford Taylor, who is the Chief Justice for the city of Hampton. We've had numerous athletes. One who's still playing ball is Allen Iverson. While some changes have been made to the facade of some of the original Aberdeen Garden homes, for the most part, the community maintains its charm and forever embraces the history that the members of this close-knit community hold so dear. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. Now, if you'd like a copy of the WHRO African American History brochure, visit anotherview.tv and send us a note, and we'll be happy to send it to you. Now, last week, I encouraged you to visit www.visionhamptonroads.com. Here's the deal. The Hampton Roads Partnership, along with other community leaders, have put together a plan for the future of the Hampton Roads region. Now they need your comments. We need you to get involved. We tend to complain that our voice is not heard when plans are being made. So here's your opportunity to let these folks know if this plan is a good one. You have until February 5th to let your voice be heard. Visit the website, read the plan, send your comments. It's your home and it's your region. Thanks again for joining us this week. Next week, we celebrate our first year anniversary. Be sure to join us on the next Another View next Friday night at 9. We'll see you then.